today, you will receive a $15 gift certificate to the restaurant. And as I was saying, I know you're thinking, Monterey is so far from San Jose, Santa Clara, but you know, what a great excuse to go for a vacation, right? Like a little quick weekend getaway. It's so beautiful. It's cooler down there. You can look at the ocean. So perfect timing for that. So chef david can you tell us since your restaurant is brand new a little bit about what you're doing there and the setting the location and everything totally so our restaurant is located in marina california right off the pacific coast highway one it's right on the beach it's a 19 acre property we have 60 luxury rooms that you, you know like just from your window you can see dolphins swimming and whales breaching and hang out right on the beach you kind of get to stay away from all the madness that Monterey Peninsula has with Carmel and Pebble Beach. It's, the resort's called The Sanctuary, and we very much treat it as that. Saltwood Kitchen and Serret is a new restaurant that we have just opened up, very heavily focused on wood-fired, cured, and fermented foods. So um, everything's coming from very local sources, like our meat's coming from Merced, our chicken's coming from Oakdale. Um, all of our seafood is being uh, fished right off our own coast. Our wine is being brought from Santa Barbara to Napa is kind of the appellation that we're focusing on. So if you came to the Monterey Peninsula and you stayed at a resort and you ate at our restaurant, even if you stayed for a week and didn't go anywhere else, you'd have a very good representation of what is happening in the Monterey Peninsula. So what are you making for us today? So today I'm going to be demonstrating a few different oyster preparations. I know that a lot of people have tried oysters. It's a little bit intimidating. Sometimes to just try them on your own. Sometimes you're hanging around that barbecue grill in your friend's backyard, grilling them, waiting for them to open uh, with Tabasco and lemon. That's a pretty common oh, way. Oh yeah, to... that's like always a good start. Yeah, yeah that, that's kind of the way. So at Saltwood Kitchen, nice Surrette, uh, we're really trying to use our um, culinary sense to make complete food ideas. So today we'll be making three different preparations of oysters, one hot and two cold. So one, uh, you guys have recipe cards on your chairs. One is gonna be apple uh, with finger lime and tarragon. One's gonna be uh, our play on the Bloody Mary cocktail. And the other one's gonna be kimchi butter with scallion. And where are you getting your oysters from? Our oysters right now, um, we have a really good partnership with Monterey Fish Company um, at a San, uh, Monterey Fish Market out of San Francisco. And they're providing us all the oysters. We have the Kushi oysters, which are coming from British Columbia, and Marin Miyagi's, which are coming from Tamales Bay, which is like right by Napa. Those are so fantastic too. Yeah. Any like questions on anything yet? So I had a question. Is it fact or fiction that you, the, the whole thing about you should only eat oysters in months with an R in it? I think it's kind of like a grandmother thing. Like, you know, kind of like chicken should be cooked well done or pork should be cooked well done. Like, trichinosis is the thing that, like, makes you sick with pork. I don't think no, so no one has ever actually contracted that in America in about 50, 60 years. So uh, we're um, definitely picking oysters at the top of the season. Like, for example, we had Fanny Bays on three weeks ago. Those are coming from the left coast of Canada. Um, and those are actually spawning right now. So we switched over to a different oyster because we want to bring them in at the peak of their season. Because you don't want to eat spawning oysters. You don't want to eat spawning oysters. You don't want to eat bad things. You get very, very sick. So let's get started. Cool. So first off, gelatin sheets. We use these in restaurants a lot. Um, at home, you're probably going to use um, powder gelatin. So the recipe for the powder gelatin, if that's what you're using, is going to be one cup of green apple juice with one packet of Nor of the Nor gelatin. So these ones, we just bloom them. I'm gonna warm up my liquid a little bit. Uh, you just, you don't wanna boil it, you just wanna heat it up. These could be bloomed in water. They're dry. So by blooming, I mean is we're just rehydrating them. And why do chefs like the, the gelatin sheets better than the I think it's just more, um, it's more controlled. Uh, when you're using powder and you're weighing things like on a gram scale, things could be like 2.1 grams, 2.7 grams. And when, when you're working in percentages, in kitchens a lot, we work off the perfect number of 100. Everything's like 100%. Like, of a recipe is 100%, yeah. But when you say like a pickling liquid is like equal parts salt and sugar to that same ratio of water or something like that. So uh, we're really focusing on those aspects of... Um, 
of cooking, it, it's a little bit more precise. And they have different gelatins for different thicknesses and hardnesses. So you want to use cold water. If you notice, they went from sheets to kind of like this jello -y substance. So this is heating up. All I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to drop them in. I'm going to give them a little stir just to dissolve the liquid. If you can see, it's kind of like all dissolved at this point. So this is something that once the gelatin is dissolved, you just let it sit in your fridge. That's it, straight up. Um, gelatin does what Jello does. When you do it with the, with the powder gelatin, which you may do at home that way, you're gonna heat up, you're, you're gonna boil your apple juice, your one cup, and you're gonna pour it over your pack of gelatin just like how you would do like the Jello from the store. You would then use your fork and you would dissolve it all the way down. Um, you would dissolve it all the way down to all the granules are gone and you just let it sit. It could take, depending on how cold your fridge is, 30 minutes to overnight. Right? <laughs> we, we all know how jello is. Yeah, I think we've all made jello at one point in our lives, right? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, um, I just barely warmed it. It's not hot at all. I'm just going to put this inside the refrigerator and let it sit. I actually had one already made because it takes a while just for the demonstration purposes. This is what it kind of looks, looks like. You could let it set in the pot or the pan, but it's just kind of like a gel. You kind of like see the consistency that it comes out. Yeah. And it, it, it just tastes like green apples. If you guys want to pass this around and kind of take a little bump off this, feel free. Just kind of put a little bit on your hand right there, like this. Just take that little bump. There you go, you want to pass it around? I actually have another special treat for you guys. This one you're gonna really like. Yeah, so my my good friends at the Caviar Company in San Francisco, they have a storefront right on California Street. So this is the Hackleback row that they have. I'm gonna pass this around. You guys can take a little bump of caviar in the meantime. Don't eat the whole jar yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Share. <laughs> what we're gonna do is same exact sir. You wanna be in charge of this one? You're just gonna take a little bit of this, slap it right there on each person's hand, and they're gonna. Here, I'll do one with you first. Ready? Uh, you, you, you didn't cheers me. You, you're definitely going to want to cheers your neighbor. Here, come on. You got to do another one now. Here, hold on. Here you go. Cheers, brother. Cheers. Ooh, yeah. I need a picture of that. Alright, we'll get one. You want to pass this out? Sure. So, I know a lot of um, chefs love to eat caviar this way, just right. off their fist like this. And it's because you get the true flavor of it without Straight up, masking yeah. it and with like creme fraiche or you know bread of any sort of crackers. Totally. Caviar and oysters is kind of like apple and oysters. They, I don't know who invented them together, but they are, they are amazing. So I'm, uh, we don't have a grill here at Saltwood. We use a wood fire grill. Today we're using the Cuisinart oven, which has all the... Um, it, it, it's an air fry oven where you can bake, grill, fry, broil, warm, toast. So today we're going to be using it on the a broil setting, which kind of will kind of like um, function as a grill. The next prep so while that's setting, the next preparation I have for you guys is the recipe for the kimchi butter. So I have room temperature butter that I made here. Uh, uh, is it unsalted? Yeah, it's yeah, it's unsalted. I'm not using any salt in any of the preparations because I would definitely want to bring up the, nat the uh, natural oceanic flavors from the um, oysters themselves. So this is kimchi. A lot of us are familiar with this. It's fermented cabbage with chili and salt. So I'm just putting this in here. And then I have lap chong. Lap chong is a sweet Chinese sausage. You guys, uh, is everyone familiar with this? It comes in the red package. It doesn't have to go in the refrigerator. Here you go. It, it doesn't have to go in the refrigerator or anything like that. So I just like chop it up. I already have it chopped up. So I'm going to render it down. 
just to get a little bit of that heat and fat going. <laughs> so I'm gonna get the pan a little bit hot. So I just have kimchi and butter straight up. You don't want to fry it or anything like that. You just want to lightly warm it. Because you kind of want to like let that fat kind of seep out of it and let that infuse into the butter itself. What else could you use this on? Chow mein, fried rice, oh. <laughs> breakfast. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it, it's a very common ingredient in Asian cooking, especially Chinese. They really, really like that stuff. We do, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, like, like I said, at Saltwood, we try to use complete food ideas to be able to um, make this a reality and make, you know, because like we're chefs, we're thinking. The red wine mignonette is super nice, cocktail horseradish sauce, super nice, but here we're really focusing on um, trying to take that to the next level and give you guys that, that, that experience. So, while you're warming it, as you can notice, it's kind of like warming up a little bit kind of like listening. You just want to get it slightly warm. So Chef David, if you don't know his background, has cooked at some of the finest restaurants in the Bay Area, including uh, Michelin Star Qua and Atelier Cren, both in San Francisco. So what was it like to um, cook under such a demanding, such a um, exacting kind of environment as those types of restaurants? It's, it teaches you a lot about yourself as well as food. It gives you a certain level of work ethic and appreciation for the for all the relationships that we're building from farmers to delivery people to the pickers. Everyone that, that's involved in this process is super important to us making a good restaurant. So um, this is, a, as you guys can see, it's already kind of bubbling up. I'm just going to put this inside here. Mix it up. This could hold for a while, so if you make like a decent sized batch at home, uh, what I do is I roll it in like torsions or like in logs, and I wrap it in plastic. So some of the best tools you have in the kitchen, I know there's a lot, a lot of tools you could buy here at Macy's, like the oven, or a knife, or a spatula. My favorite tools for this is my hands. So, you can't buy those here. Yeah, you, can, you can't buy new feet or hands, ever. So, I just like to squeeze it all together. Plus, it looks like it'd be very moisturizing for your skin, too. Oh, it's so good for you. <laughs> Me growing up, you know, uh -huh. it's like a, my substitute to lotion, <laughs> butter. So, you just squeeze it up. In the restaurant, we use a mixer because we'd make like a bigger batch. So, we put it inside the KitchenAid. For this amount, I don't even know if your KitchenAid would spin. You know, kind of like when you're trying to blend like this much smoothie, it doesn't really work at home. So, it's a pretty simple preparation. I just pre-cut everything, and now I have this butter. You guys can see. It's just infused. So, this, you can just roll into a log, set in the fridge, you'll be fine. Any questions? So, you guys uh, cook with oysters at home, or? Eat oysters when you go out? Yeah, big oyster fan, that's good. <laughs> yes. So what made you want to become a chef? I wanted to be a chef out of high school. Um, I remember wanting to be a chef and my mom was like, no, go to college, do that whole thing. Chefing is a lot of sacrifice. It's, you don't get paid a lot of money normally. Um, it's a lot of work, you miss Valentine's Day, birthday, New Year's Eve, every day that you guys all want to go out to eat, someone's cooking for you. <laughs> so she was kind of like, you know, just like go to college, get a regular education. I very much had that fire that I, you know, I'm, I'm very hands on. There's, you know, like there's all different kinds of learners, which you'll learn about like kinesthetic, visual, audible. Chefs are kind of all three. So this I'll just re uh, reserve in the fridge. So is your mom happy now that you became a chef? Are you happy, mom? Oh, she's here. <laughs> Are you happy? Everybody does now. Well, I'm happy that he's happy. Oh, you're happy that he is. That's the best <laughs> answer. <laughs> that. Cool. So, 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 mom, who's the better cook, you or him? 
Uh, that might be faster, but she definitely has the, the love part down. Oh, yeah, and you can't teach that, yeah. Yeah, so these are finger limes. These are like um, a fruit that grows off a shrub from like New Zealand or Australia. We're just so fortunate uh, with this day and age that these actually grow in um, Santa Barbara, California, which is not that far of a drive. You want to do some bumps for everyone? Just squeeze a little you on your hand and here, you go, take some we'll, to eat. We'll, we'll it's fantastic. It and right. do smell them because they are very aromatic. Ready? Almost Cheers. kind of like kefir lime leaves. They're kind of like little explosions of lemon and lime. So, Chef, if people cannot get those easily at their farmer's market or... Yeah, you can buy them at your market. farmer's market, uh, luxury what grocery they, stores. What can they use instead? If you don't have a finger lime, we could do segments of lemons and limes, just the wedges of them, cut out the pulps and just dice them up, and then you could put that inside every oyster. Uh, you'll still get the same excitement of the, the citric and all that flavor and all that stuff that's going on. So... I have a, another demo. The next recipe that I'm doing is the play on Bloody Mary. One of, I think like margarita and Bloody Mary are probably like America's favorite drinks that you can have. So this is a very simple thing. I have some pickled onion that I made. This is a shallot that's pickled. So I'll just mix this up in there. This is radish. You know, everyone knows radishes. Little red ones. There's all different kinds. These are red globes. These are cornichon, which are little baby gherkin pickles. You can buy them at you know regular like grocery store in the jar section, like like next to the capers and stuff. And this is celery. Pretty basic. If you guys notice all the cuts, I use the mandolin, which you could buy here, and it helps. Um, I just kind of like slice them into little strips and then... Oh, that's a good way to dice. Yeah, yeah you know. Just doing it all on your knife. Yeah. yeah. It's like even though like um, I have a exceptional knife skills, some of us at home don't. It takes a long time sometimes. Like it could take an hour or two longer just to cook a nice meal because of how slow your knife moves or how fast, however you look at it. So like at home, when my wife cooks, she tells me if I could uh, cut for her. Can you cut everything for oh, me? Because nice. it's a lot quicker. Like, uh, yeah. So I'm like, I'm, I'm actually the sous chef at home, and she's the executive chef. You're so. like the human Cuisinart. Yeah, exactly. So it just has uh, equal parts. You guys have the recipe on your cards. It has a, uh, 50 grams of vodka. It's like a nice fat shot. It's like a double. Almost. And Worcestershire sauce. Everyone kind of has this. This is like the stuff that like my mom, when we were growing up, she made beef steak out of. So, it comes in the Bloody Mary. So I just take this, mix it all up, and this is my mignonette. You know, as we all know, mignonette is like onion, shallots, black pepper, that kind of basic thing. So, if you notice, it's just kind of all mixed up in there. It's all the same stuff that comes in the Bloody Mary, like the onions, the celery, I um, took some fire roasted, I uh, grilled a tomato. We don't have a grill here, but I um, pre uh, fire roasted a tomato and I just chopped it up with my hands. And um, it's just this. I actually put this inside the oyster. So that's pretty chill. So, how do you decide, like, what flavors go best with an oyster? Because your, your toppings are quite inventive and sort of out of the box and so how do you figure out well, what is going to work well and what's not so there are different solidities and brininess in oysters and they have different like um all oysters are very much the same they're bivalve mollusks some of them have more like salty flavor more brine it also it, it comes from like where they're where they come from like if they're in the warm waters cold waters like the east coast oysters it, the water is a lot colder there versus the west coast pacific oysters so these ones we um I like, like the kushis, the ones that we're serving for the cold preparations. They're much cleaner, fresher, more vibrant. The uh, Marin Miyagi's have a lot more earthy, uh, they have deeper cups. So like the shell is a big thing too. Like if they have deeper cups, then you could hold more of the juice and stuff in there. So 
that's pretty basic uh, for that kind of stuff. Those 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 big ones that you buy at the grocery store, if like you need to find uh, oysters and they don't have them at your regular market, like they're pretty common now in grocery stores. You can find them at like a commercial wharf. The farmers market sells them at the seafood stands. The Asian supermarkets generally always have oysters. Um, your your basic seafood market in your neighborhood. That that's totally where I would find oysters at. But where the flavor profiles come from is we try to think about what what we where we want to take that and where we want to bring that experience to. This is some fresh horseradish because everyone's had prepa uh, prepared horseradish. Uh, it's just it's a root that grows, and uh, I like to use this for the um, versus the prepared because I already have the Worcestershire sauce, and that kind of has a little bit of like that acidity or like that pickle flavor. So fresh horseradish just gives me a, a nice little hit. And fresh, as opposed to the jarred stuff, is much more potent, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. And you guys will taste that here in a few minutes. So uh, these are scallions. I use this for the garnish for my kimchi butter uh, oyster. So I'm just gonna like, you don't really want to uh, bruise your scallions. You just want to kind of like run your knife through them because you want to get that crunch and you want to keep all that juice in there. Is the Arctic one that we call green onions? Excuse me. Is the Arctic ones that we call green onions? Yeah, yeah the green onions oh. or scallions. Yeah, correct. I like them a lot. You could just grill these too by themselves. So yeah, you just run your knife through them. Um, it's good. It's really important to have a sharp knife. If you guys don't have a sharp knife, they got knives here. They have <laughs> knives here. <laughs> yeah. So, any, any questions, guys? See how like my knife just cuts straight through them. Not too much of a fancy knife. It's just the way that you 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 keep them. See, I want you to cut everything for me at my house too. <laughs> you here. Yeah. So I'm gonna save these. So that's kind of how you prepare most of the stuff. They're very simple. A lot of the work is just in the preparation of it, in the in the cutting. But other than that, you can pretty much host a pretty cool. Like if you're doing a potluck or your party, this is a pretty good way to like impress your guests. Mm. Say, hey, look, dude, I made these like really cool oysters. So, I'm gonna I I'm gonna start plating them up. You guys feel good about that? You gonna show people how to shuck an oyster too? Totally. And there is an art to that and a skill. So I I actually got very very excited when I was shucking them and pre-shucked all of them. <laughs> I saved one and I threw it away because oh, no. it was opening, but let's not worry about that. But I'll, I'll definitely explain it to you right now. So I'm going to get these in the oven for now to start so we can taste them. Yeah, so we'll let these things roast, put the timer on them. Once they start bubbling, they'll be good. You want to be in charge of this? You let me know when they start bubbling, all right? So. I already put the gel and tarragon on these, but the way that it works is oysters are a bivalve mollusk uh, shellfish. There's a shell on top. They're either called the right shell or left shell or top shell or bottom shell. You're going to have an oyster knife. They're not you very. You can't use a regular knife. No. Um, these have a little bit thicker metal, and if you have a nice fancy uh, uh, knife at home, you could definitely damage it. You could buy them at like a restaurant supply store or online or anything like that. They have a little bit thicker metal, see like it doesn't really bend. So, you're gonna stick it in towards the back of the oyster, right here, and you're just gonna wedge it. Just pop it open, and then you're just gonna scrape the top of the shell. Then, you'll take your knife and you'll scrape the bottom of the shell, and that's what releases it from its uh, cast. All oysters, are, all oysters are the same, like on how you open them. The bigger ones or smaller ones, it doesn't mean it's going to be easier or harder to open. It's just, that's what it is. So, Should people like, um, be using gloves or...? Yeah, what I do is I grab a towel and I stick the oyster inside it. And I try to protect my hand that way. 
Because you don't want to stab yourself. You, you definitely know, don't want to stick an oyster knife through your hand. Your, it's <laughs> yeah. Yes, we have the gloves. Macy's has these really cool cut gloves. Yeah. That protect your hand. That will protect your hand. Pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> totally. So, these oysters, if you guys noticed, I kind of put the tomato, the fire roasted tomato, the apple, and the finger lime already in here. So, I think we're ready to serve the apple ones. And the. So. I got some crushed ice here. So if people are doing this at home, you, they should shuck the oysters just before serving? You definitely want to shuck the oysters ahead of time for the <laughs> and just get them ready. So the hold okay for like an hour before? Yeah, for sure. You could even like, if you go to like your fish market, they could even pre-shuck them for you and um, give them to you like on a tray. So it's pretty cool. So these ones just have the apple gel, some finger lime, and tarragon. And I'll start plating up the Bloody Marys. You have a little plate under your chairs, everybody, that you can use. And yeah, and put your before yeah, you did. You can't get the fresh shell. I can get. I can get more. Don't worry, I got. What do you think of jarred so, yeah. oysters? Oh. Can't They're just. Yeah, yeah you don't that, really need if that. Uh, you could only you get the jarred utensils, oysters. That's totally fine. I would find a vessel to serve them in. You know, like if you could find like another, um, like a, something to serve them in for the cold, whether you're putting them in spoons or you have some other vessel, like little shot cups or you do like, you know, like oyster shots or something like that. That could totally work also. Any other questions? Everybody's too busy eating. <laughs> yeah. So, for the horseradish, I use a microplane. Uh, all you guys are pretty um, familiar with these zesters. If you don't have one, they sell them here. So I just lightly grate some of the horseradish on them. Here's some of the Bloody Marys, yeah. if you guys want to pass yeah. these out. Anyone want a Bloody Mary oyster? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what do we think of these? Good? I'm going to go out there. After you taste all three, I'm going to have you ask you which one you guys like the best. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chef, you were explaining that some of your favorite oysters come from Washington, but that they're difficult to get now? Yeah, the Olympias are kind of going through their struggles right now. They're my because favorites. Because of uh, changing water temperatures, because of global warming. And yeah, all that fun stuff definitely affects our waters. That's why... Um, <laughs> Opening Saltwood Kitchen and Oysterette, I really wanted to focus on sustainable seafood, help our oceans, help our, um, so our kids and our families can be able to enjoy things for years to come. Like I have a great partnership with the Monterey Abalone Company, Monterey Red Abalones. We're just covered, just covered the shores of Monterey for, um, and when settlers came, like the Portuguese and the Chinese and all the um, Czechs and all those people that came over to, um, Monterey, they started depleting our natural resources. They definitely, uh, th this year, they were even talking about possibly cutting that short, like cutting our Monterey abalone season short from uh, 
people that are uh, collecting and stuff like that. Like abalone fishery has become like this crime or kind of like this. Yeah, uh, because you um, you can as a person of the public you can go diving for abalone, but it's very regular. Yes. How large they have to be if you take them and how many you can take per day. And um, as a restaurateur, you cannot sell those abalone that someone just like went out there and caught. You have to actually buy farm joints that are sustainably raised and protected. Totally. So we have our good friends at the Monterey Abalone Company that are trying to keep that um, that alive. We have the uh, Moss Landing Hatchery now. It's been open for the four years. So to make like a full size abalone to sell, it like, takes like four years, and it's like. 55 centimeters. They're about that big. Across. They're small. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're not that big. They take about four, four years. Four years to, to get to that small size. To get to like mature, yeah. How are we looking? What do you guys think? It's not, small. It's not bubbly yet? No. Oh, yeah, it's getting there. I'm going to do, almost, almost. I'm gonna do a quick flip on this just to rotate them. Okay. But actually, I think they're ready. Those are good. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. We sell these, by the way. They're very useful. They're very useful. And remember, if you spend $35 or more today in the home department, you can get a $15 gift certificate to Chef David's restaurant in Monterey. Yeah, it's super nice. So at, at Saltwood, we definitely try to uh, pay homage to all the farmers, fishermen, meat guys, ranchers, everything like that. We're definitely cooking for the working man, the families, luxury travelers, foodies, everyone belongs there. We have so many different dining environments from like our sunset deck where you could just watch the sunset on, you know, on the Pacific Ocean to um, like Seoul. Okay. <laughs> Where you could come with your. Um, Grace is convinced already. Yeah. She's like heading there right after this. <laughs> yeah, like we've been doing many like corporate retreats for like the Googles, Apples, Adobe's, all those fancy groups. They come like buy out their resort, we cook for them. Uh, it, it's a place where you're, like uh, people go on business trips a lot. You could come, have one, one too many old fashions at the bar, watch the game. Next day, your, your, your wife and kids come into town with the grandparents. You guys go for your nice family restaurant, you know, like everyone goes out to eat. Maybe the next day your uh, your uh, parents watch the kids, and you guys go out to your nice restaurant where you wear like your clothes. So we definitely have all those environments at Saltwood. So really fortunate to have those. We also have rest, um, not recipes. Yeah. So just be careful when you grab these. They're gonna be they're gonna be a little bit warm. Correct. Yeah. We actually have a pretty good pastry program. We have one of our good friends, Edward Martinez, who is most recently the pastry chef of Lazy Bear in San Francisco, oh, wow. uh, doing uh, heading up our pastry department. Another Michelin star. Yeah. <laughs> like, wait, what? You uh, have a good crew there. Yeah. Yeah. We've been really lucky. Uh, who well, wouldn't want to go live today. right by the beach? You know, like, that's why I moved there, to have more of a relaxed lifestyle, have have a family, and kind of chill out. So, Chef, if you could eat only one seafood for the rest of your life, what would it be? Probably fish. Does that count? Fish? Yeah, so what kind of fish? <laughs> it's so broad. I would probably say salmon. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I think our local salmon is a super nice. Growing up, I have a kind of a bias to this. My dad's a fisherman. Okay. So growing up, on, on, on his weekends, we would go and uh, fishing every, every week and uh, go with the... Our salmon season is a little bit slower now, how they started changing like the delta and all the streams and the ducks and where everyone, how all the fish go and travel. I have a few more here if you need to re-up. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I like salmon. I really like oysters a lot too, I must say. Uh, oysters are so versatile. Yeah, maybe about six more. Do you want to give us some uh, tips about how best best to uh, pan fry fish, scallops, and shrimp? How do you get a good yeah, sear have, uh, on fish and scallops? You're definitely going to want them dry. 
and you're going to want a nice hot pan and one that isn't warped. Should it be non-stick or not necessarily? Um, for, for a fish, it doesn't have to be non-stick. I actually prefer just a regular stainless steel pan to get a good sear on a fish. Uh, you, if you want a crispy skin. Yeah? If you, if, if you just want to get a nice sear, this pan would probably be like the best thing for you. <coughs> like, for sure. Depending what kind of fish. Uh, fish could purge stuff out, like say like for salmon, there's this thing called albumin, which is the protein in the salmon. Once all the white stuff starts coming out, it means the fish got, got, uh, got kind of blasted. Um, most fish will start milking out once they're fully cooked, and that's how you could tell. For shrimp, it's the color change. They'll go from like this opaque color to more like a rosy orange color. Uh, for scallops, you definitely want a dry scallop, hot pan. So you're just going to sear them and then you'll start seeing like the brown color rise on the side. That's when you know they're ready to flip. When you're searing any kind of meat, once you put it in a pan, it's going to stick. And once it unsticks, it means that it's ready to go. So like if you just give it a little shake and it's stuck, it's stuck. The fish already knows what it's doing. Normally we're the ones that don't know what we're doing. <laughs> so we just have to be patient and not like always want to flip things. Yeah, you know, kind of like let it do its thing, be patient. You really want to think about cause and effect and why things are happening. Not how they're happening, it's why. That's the most important part in cooking, which you'll learn, especially like in the restaurants that we spoke about. It's uh, why things are happening. Because it's easy. Oh, yeah, how? Yeah, you get a pan, you put it hot, you put some eggs in there, you scramble it. Well, I don't know how it never comes out right. It's always burnt. It's why. Was the pan too hot? Was it too cold? Did you leave it too long? Because there's seven ways to denature a protein, as we all know, like time, temperature, physical agitation, salt, you know, acidity, you know, all those different ways on how to change, like, how to change that. And that's kind of is what's happening uh, when you're cooking a fish or a shrimp or a scallop. One of my favorite ways to prepare all those things that you just said is a seafood boil. Oh, seafood boil. Yeah. yeah. So if you guys uh, don't... too, right? Yeah. yeah, we actually have our own saltwood seafood boil. We're getting head-on Monterey shrimp, which are fished by uh, Adam Aliotti on the Spot Prawn Bro. So there's two people that own um, Spot Prawn licenses, John and Adam Aliotti in the Monterey Peninsula. So all those Spot Prawns that come to uh, San Francisco or anywhere in pretty much America that come from Monterey Bay are fished by two boats. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. So we have a good partnership with all of them, with uh, those two guys, and they're bringing us... Um, all the spot fronts, all the stuff. So we're using the Monterey head on shrimp, mussels, clams, we're using some lamb sausage, and we're doing like this like Old Bay kind of like lobster stock. Comes with some baby potatoes and some grilled corn. Do you just throw it on the table afterward? <laughs> <laughs> I did that for a wedding a few weeks ago at Saltwood, but this actually comes in a plate. When my son Maxim comes, he's come like three or four times to the restaurant now since we opened in three weeks. And he just smacks the seafood boil down. He's like, I want more corn. You know, like, yeah, at, at Saltwood, we're very uh, catered to everyone. So, like, our kids' menu, we don't have a kids' menu that serves, like, chicken fingers and pizza and those kind of stuff. We're actually cooking real food. Uh, growing up, I was really blessed. I didn't think about it back when I was a kid. Like, oh, I want pizza. I want McDonald's. I want all that stuff. My mom was very much, like, wanted us to eat good food. She would, you know, like we would soak beans the night before we ate, you know, so we had to cook beans the next day. If you want tortillas, you have to make tortillas. It was kind of a thing in our house. And um, I really was very much want to raise our community like that. You know, as being chefs, we're like kind of role models or mentors in our community and people kind of like take that lead. So if I could take anything from that, I would definitely want to cook for the kids. So we let, the, we pretty much cook anything that the kid would want to eat but just in our realm. So like we do like kids pasta. We have long noodles or short noodles. Like long noodles could be like bucatini or parpadelli or linguini or fettuccine. A short noodle could be like a cavatelli, like a fresh made cavatelli. We cook them in butter, we could do a cream sauce, we could do anything like that. Then we have all these great vegetables that grow in our area. Uh, we have, we've been very blessed to have partnerships with um, a lot of local farms. We have Dick Swank's tomatoes and carrots. Like uh, this is Dick Swank's tomato. Like, 
they're just so good. Like, I don't even like tomatoes growing up that much. Like, I used to give all my tomatoes to my little sister, and she used to eat the tomatoes. Uh, <laughs> food is a way that um, you could uh, definitely show how you feel. It's uh, all parties at home are kind of raised around the kitchen. Every, every family party is a potluck. You bring food. It's kind of like that common denominator that people don't really think about. We like eat to live. So like, why not eat good food? Exactly. So much a part of our life, so much enjoyment from it. So. Yeah. So like, we're just really blessed to have all those uh, aspects, especially in the Monterey Peninsula. We have like everything growing from the Salinas Valley. We have all the lettuce people, the berry people from Watsonville, the artichokes from Pizzini Farms. It's like everything's there. And like, as a chef uh, living and cooking in that area, you couldn't be happier. Any questions? Any other questions? Yeah. What's up? Cooking a salmon fillet because my salmon gets stuck on the pan. So what am I not doing? Um, it's either you're not lubricating that enough enough, um, depending how you're doing it, like if you're baking it or you're cooking it in a pan, it's because you're fussing with it before it's ready to be turned. So my art reaction, which is browning, happens at 310 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, your pan could be 400 degrees, but once you put the fish in, it might drop to 200. You have to let that heat come right back up. These pans are super nice because the quartz, or like the double bottom pots, which they sell here, that'll uh, help maintain your heat in your pan. Like, like a, this pan's kind of thick, you know that? So a, a good quality pan will super help out that process, and just a little bit of patience. Okay. Thank you. For sure. Pan will lose pot, searing pot. Yeah, you want like you don't want it smoking hot. Different and also your oils. Different oils. Like if you're using like extra virgin olive oil, it's more of a natural, more fruity oil. It's not meant to get that hot. The, the, every oil has a different smoke point. So like for searing fish, I would like just recommend like a blend oil, like a canola blend, grapeseed, one of those kind of oils. Um, I know we all want to be fancy and we all have the best stuff at home, but you really need to use the right tool for the right job, and that includes like oil. <laughs> Like, super important. Microwave? Yeah. To cook the fish? Or? Yeah, well, microwaves is actually like, you'll be surprised, will cook things very consistent. I haven't really t uh, tried too much in microwaves on how to cook fish, but I know that you could do like hard boiled eggs, scrambled eggs, poached eggs, and all that stuff in the microwave. Um, I don't know. I'm sure they sell a microwave here that has a fish setting. <laughs> yeah, I've never tried it myself. Because it's too much fun to do it this way. Yeah, time. but like at home, we learned this, like my mom has this rule, the dinner is eat or don't eat. So like, um, you notice a lot of um, families, they like different meat temperatures. When I cook, I normally cook everything pretty medium rare. Uh, so that kind of like leads me to that point when someone that wants it more cooked, they can put it on the microwave. Oh, we've, yeah. we've done that before. <laughs> yeah, you could buy them at like your um, luxury grocery places. You could also buy them online, um, like you know Amazon and those kind of companies. Like this days, everything's so accessible online. You don't even have to leave your house. But um, yeah, if you go to like some gourmet food places, they have them. The way that we buy them, they come like in 300 sheets, in a, you know, in a box, which is rather excessive for home. For home use, I highly recommend just using like the Nor packets because they come in like four in a box. One packet is one cup of juice. Bang. Any other questions? Okay, so who's who's like the kimchi one the best? Oh, the butter one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Who yeah. like the apple one the best? And who like the the what was it, finger line? Who finger, liked that one the best? No, it's the uh, Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary one. I'm sorry. Oh. That one was good, huh? Okay, some of you didn't vote. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll eat a whole jar of caviar when we're done. Here. Okay, promise, promise. All right. <laughs> well, thank you guys for being with us. Give a round of applause for Chef David for being here all the way to And again, I want to remind you, you spent $35 or more in the home store today. 
You'll receive a $15 gift certificate to Saltwick Kitchen and Oysterette on the Monterey Peninsula. And we hope will, you guys will join us for our next demo, which will be in November. It's Saturday, November 11th at 1 p.m. And it's going to be the folks from Tacalicious, which has a number of outlets around here, including San Gennaro. So we're going to have a fun time with a bunch of tacos there. So hope you join us for that in November. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Really appreciate it.